morning. Uh, welcome everyone to Good News, both here and online. Today is our first Sunday of our sermon series, Hidden in Plain Sight. It's been said that when God wants to reveal himself, he hides himself. So, for example, uh, in his word, we uh, see God's will and everything that he wants in his word. And the greatest example of God revealing himself and yet hiding himself is Jesus. And God himself became like one of us so that sinful human beings could see and embrace God himself. Lord bless your worship today. We'll begin with our opening hymn. stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his holy life and innocent death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, 
Your mercy attends us all of our days. Be our strength and support amid the wearisome changes of this world. And at life's end, grant us your promised rest and the full joys of your salvation. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue with the psalm of the day. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Find rest, O my soul, in God alone. My hope comes from him. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from Exodus chapter 33, where Moses is looking uh, from God for a concrete sign that he is truly with his people. And he asks God for something that no one has ever seen before. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have, will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand, and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will continue with the hymn of the day, My Soul Finds Rest in God Alone. Money so my dream. 
The word of God to which we turn our attention this morning is written in the gospel according to St. Matthew chapter 11. Please stand for the gospel. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and have revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Perhaps there are no two better words to describe the way that we communicate these days, the way that messages are sent and received, the way that information is publicized and then consumed, than the two words, on demand. When we want an answer to a question, we no longer go and look it up in the encyclopedia. We just Google it. If we want to know what's happening in our world, we don't have to wait until the 6 o'clock nightly news. We just pull our phones out of our pockets. If we want to watch the next episode in our favorite TV show, we don't have to wait until Thursday night at 8, 7 central. We instead just stream it right there on the spot. We get the information that we want whenever and wherever and however we want it. In fact, I, I was amazed recently to hear someone talk about an experience that they had had in their childhood. This person had grown up in a very rural and remote area, one of those areas where every home in the, the small little country area was all on the same phone line. And so it could happen that you would pick up the receiver of the phone to make a phone call only to find out that the person in the house down the road was already using the phone. And so you had to wait until that person's conversation was done until you could go ahead and use the phone. All of that waiting just to make a phone call. It's almost hard to believe that someone who is alive right now could have possibly had that experience as a child. In fact, compare that to an experience that my children just recently had. As some of you know, it was a week ago Friday that we moved into our new house here in Mount Horeb. And in advance of that move, our internet service provider had told us that at this new house, everything was already hooked up and all they needed to do was switch the service over from one house to the other. Well, it turns out that it wasn't all hooked up and so they had to send someone out but that person couldn't come that Friday that we moved. They had to come the following Tuesday. And then not only that, but they were supposed to come first thing Tuesday morning, but they ended up coming way later in the evening on Tuesday. Now, mind you, during this entire time, we still had our phones that we could use as hotspots. But based on my children's reaction, you would think that they had gone through some inhumane ordeal that violates the terms of the Geneva Convention to have to go for 100 hours without wireless internet. We get very used to having our information and our communication on demand. Now, if that's the case, then what Jesus wants to say to us in the verses that are in front of us this morning will present us with a bit of a challenge. Out of everything that comes at us in our world on demand, Jesus wants to make it very clear that one of them is not the truth about God. If we want to know not just the news and not just the weather, but if we want to know God, if we want to know who he is, if we want to know what he is up to and how he operates, if we want to know what he wants for us and what he wants from us, we aren't able to just learn that information on our own terms. 
the majesty and the mystery of our God cannot simply be discovered by us. It needs to be revealed to us. And so as we look at these verses from Matthew chapter 11 this morning, we're going to see that the truth about God does not come to us on demand. Instead, we are at Jesus' mercy to reveal heavenly mystery. In fact, that's what Jesus had been doing recently. He had been traveling throughout Galilee, the the northern part of Israel, doing that very thing, revealing the truth about God through preaching and teaching. And at the start of these verses, Jesus describes the results that that was having. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. So the smart and sophisticated in Jesus' day were missing out on all of this divine truth. Meanwhile, the simple and the lowly were embracing it. And this wasn't some flaw or some failure. Jesus praises God for this. This is the very thing that God himself was pleased to do. Now, that is the exact opposite of what you would expect if we could, on our own, discover the truth about God. If the truth about God came to us on our own terms, well, then the wise and the learned would have a leg up. And the simple and the lowly, people like little children, they would be at a severe disadvantage. But that's not how it works with God. And that's why Jesus goes on to say, All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. The truth about God does not come to us on demand or on our own terms. Instead, it needs to be revealed by God himself, and specifically, it is revealed through Jesus. Jesus says that no one knows the Father except him, and no one knows him except the Father. That truth about God is like top-secret, highly classified information that just the two of them have. No one is going to figure it out on their own. No one is going to be granted that exclusive tell-all interview. No one is going to hack into their divine brains and then leak the information to the public. The only way the truth about God gets out is if Jesus himself reveals it. We are at Jesus' mercy to reveal divine mystery. Now, as I mentioned before, in our world where just about everything else comes to us on demand, on our own terms, that presents us with a bit of a challenge. We would like to think that we can figure out God for ourselves. We would like to think that we can learn about God on our own terms. Now, I'm not talking about being able, for example, to watch church online during a time of pandemic. I'm not talking about the technology that allows us to read our Bibles without having a physical book in front of us, but just opening up an app on our phone. Those pieces of technology can be tremendous blessings. Well, then what am I talking about? Well, how about every time we begin a statement about God with the words, I think, or I feel, or in my opinion, as if any of those things all by themselves, would make what we are about to say about God true? Or how about that ever popular statement that we can be spiritual without being religious? That we can have this this personal and private relationship with God just between us and him, and we don't need religion, we don't need church, we don't ever need to go to the place where the word of, of God is being preached and is being taught. Or how about when we decide to engage in specific behavior in our lives. We decide that we're going to live a a certain way, we're going to act and talk a certain way, we're going to manage our finances and our calendars a certain way, we're going to raise our kids a certain way, simply because it's what we want to do, and then retroactively we go back and assert that surely God is okay with the way that we are living, even when perhaps he makes it very clear in his word that he is in fact not. Or what about when we assume that God operates, or at least God ought to operate, the way that we would operate if we were God? And then when he doesn't, we get angry with him, or we criticize him, or maybe someone even sort of shakes their fist at God and says, well, I'm not going to believe in a God that would ever do that or act in that way. 
We want our truth about God, our information about God, the same way that we get our news and our Netflix. On demand, in our control. Jesus makes it very clear it doesn't work that way. And that's why what Jesus says was happening, was happening. The smart and the sophisticated were missing out. Meanwhile, the simple and the lowly were embracing the truth about God. Now, at first, that might sound like that's not a very good thing that was going on. It almost makes it sound as though Jesus was playing favorites, as if discovering the truth about God is sort of like discovering a hidden treasure. And Jesus was giving a treasure map to this group over here, but letting this group over here just kind of fend for themselves. That's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that he reveals the truth about God in a way that is so mysterious, so seemingly bizarre, that those who think they already have it all figured out, that those who think that they can figure out God on their own will likely miss it. We might think of it this way. Imagine if I told you that one of these Bugatti vehicles, I'm not going to even try and pronounce the model name, but this is the most expensive car in the world. It's worth about $19 million. Imagine if one of these were for sale, not ex at some exclusive dealership over in Europe or wherever Bugattis get made, but it was up for auction right here at our Wisconsin surplus auction just outside of town, available to the highest better, bidder, no doubt, at a drastically reduced price. Or what if I told you that the Star of Africa diamond, the largest diamond in the world, 530 carats, was available, not locked up in some vault, not mounted in the scepter of the Queen of England, like it is, but instead it's just sitting on the shelf at the dollar store over in Madison. Or what if I told you that a pair of these shoes was available, covered in gold, studded with diamonds, worth $17 million? What if I told you that someone had donated them to our local community clothes closet and they were just sitting there on the shelf, ready and waiting for the taking? Now, anyone who thinks that they know how things like this work and who thinks that they know where things like this are available and for what they are available, would no doubt never even think about going to those places to look for those items. Even though those items could very well be sitting in those places, they would miss out because they think they already have everything figured out. But do you know who might actually go and look and find and see? A child, someone who doesn't think that they have it all figured out, someone who is willing to listen to what other people tell them, no matter how seemingly bizarre it sounds? Well, in the very same way, if Jesus took heaven's best treasures and he put them in the places where we usually expect to find really good, really expensive, really valuable things, then they would only be available to a certain class of people, the select, the elite, the wise and the sophisticated, the wealthy and the powerful, the alphas and the overachievers. But instead, Jesus takes heaven's best gifts and he puts them in the last place you would ever expect to find them. Which, yes, on the one hand means that some people who think they've got it all figured out, they never will. But on the other hand, it means that anyone and everyone can. Those priceless gifts of heaven are just sitting there waiting for anyone to be able to receive them. It's easy for us to want the truth about God to be available to us on demand, but it's a good thing we are at Jesus' mercy to reveal divine mystery. Can I give you an example? I can't help but wonder if, if Jesus was actually thinking that before he said what he said next. He had just sort of laid out this principle about how he takes heaven's best gifts and he puts them in the least likely of places. And then he gives the people who are listening to him the perfect example of exactly what he's talking about. The gift in question is a gift that we are all seeking in our lives. In fact, it's one that we all very much need. It is the gift of rest. And I'm not talking about a day off from our jobs. I'm not talking about a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon where we can sit on our couches and put our feet up. Not physical rest, but spiritual rest. The wonderful, priceless gift of not feeling as though there is this burden of guilt weighing down on your shoulders because of some of the things that you've done 
or some of the opportunities that you've let pass you by, but instead, the wonderful feeling of that burden being lifted. The wonderful gift of not feeling inadequate or insecure because somehow in spite of everything that you've done and everything that you've striven for in your life, you still don't quite measure up, but instead the wonderful gift of peace and confidence of knowing that you have nothing left to prove, not to God and not to anyone else. That gift of rest. Jesus says, come to me. It's not available on demand. You can't find it wherever you want, but come to me and I will give you rest. But then notice who he invites. We'd maybe expect Jesus to invite the self-starters, the determined and the driven. Those are the kinds of people who can do the things that are needed in order to earn that rest. But instead, Jesus invites the weary and the burdened, the tired and the worn out, people who know that all the drive and all the determination, determination in the world have been unable to get them anywhere with God. People who have reached the very end, the very limit of their ability and are ready to give up. That's who Jesus invites. And then notice how he delivers the rest that he promises. We maybe expect Jesus to say, don't worry, I know you're tired, but, but you're almost there. You can do it. Just a couple more steps. I know this burden is getting heavy, but you've got this. Instead, Jesus says, stop right there. Don't take one more step. Put that burden down. And instead, take my yoke upon you. Yes, Jesus does put a yoke on our shoulders. He puts on our shoulders a burden of sorts. But it's not a burden of more things that we need to do. It's not another list of demands in addition to the demands we put on ourselves. Instead, it's the yoke or the burden of trusting completely in him. Trusting that everything that God's law requires of us has been done already perfectly by him. Trusting that every last ounce of guilt that otherwise would weigh down on our shoulders has already been shouldered and already been paid for by him. That yoke is trusting him entirely, that everything that is needed in order for us to enjoy that much needed rest, everything has already been done which is why Jesus can say something that sounds even more bizarre than suggesting that the Star of Africa might be available for you at the dollar store. He says, I give you a yoke that is easy, and I place on you a burden that is light. Jesus could, we might expect, in fact, Jesus to say, the rest that you seek will be your reward after successfully completing the work that you need to do. But instead, Jesus offers that rest as a completely free gift to anyone who gives up, to anyone who quits, to anyone who stops trying to carry their burden themselves and instead takes that burden that Jesus instead gives. And yes, those who think they have it all figured out, those who think that they know how God ought to work, they're going to miss this priceless, precious gift of rest. But if we are willing to become like little children, if we are willing to listen to what Jesus says, no matter how absurd it seems, then that priceless, precious gift of rest is ours. It's just sitting there ready and waiting for the taking. You know, I suppose there are some advantages to this on-demand world that we live in. And yet I think we are learning more and more that there is one giant fatal flaw. In a world where just about everything is on demand, rather than getting the information that we need or the information that is best for us, we instead just get more and more and more of the information that we already want. Have you noticed that? When you go to Google something, when you, you start typing, it already shows what other people have searched for. And in fact, it shows your own search history there. When you open up Facebook or Twitter, all of their fancy algorithms are showing you the things that they think based on your past behavior that you want to see. When you open up Netflix, there's already a list of TV shows and movies that they suggest for you based on the things that you've watched before. In fact, in a world where, where everything is on demand, it's sort of like we're constantly looking in a mirror. When we are fed things that we want, 
we get to see the truth about ourselves. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I look in that mirror, I don't always like what I see. So what a blessing that Jesus doesn't treat us in the same way. That the truth about him is not something that we just grasp at on our own terms. It's something that we don't get on demand. Instead, he gives us the truth about God that we need and the truth about God that is best for us, in spite of the fact that it's the last thing that we deserve and the last thing that we would expect. What a blessing that we are at Jesus' mercy to reveal divine mystery. Normally, that's not a good thing, right? To be completely at someone else's mercy for something so important. Normally, that's not where you want to be. Except if that person is Jesus. Except if that person has demonstrated, as Jesus had, as Jesus has, that he has so much of that mercy. Amen. Please stand and join in confessing our common Christian faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Our God and King, we bless and extol your name forever and ever. If it were not for you, nothing good would dwell in us. We thank you for the baptismal waters that washed us clean and recreated us to be your people. Help us always to live lives in service to you and in service to our neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Our loving Father, you have hidden your greatness from our wisdom and made your ways known to children. Guide us to bring our children to the waters of baptism, to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, and to know perfect rest and peace within your loving arms. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. Our gentle God and Lord, You have invited us to come to you with the heavy burdens of this life, that we may find rest and peace in your mercy. Grant relief to those who struggle, supply to those in need, hope to those who fear, and peace to those who are anxious, that we may be delivered from all adversity and brought to everlasting life, where we shall join the saints of old in your presence forevermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear Hear our our prayer. prayer. You have delivered us from this body of death and given us the hope of eternal life. Keep us ever mindful of your promises during our earthly pilgrimage, where evil is close at hand and our desire to do good does not match our ability. Allow us to look forward with faith to the time when you will bring us fully into your everlasting kingdom, where we will serve you in both mind and flesh. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you all for being here, uh, both here and online. If you would like to make an offering uh, today, you can go to goodnewslc.org slash give. And to let us know that you are here, please go to goodnewslc.org slash connect.
Our service continues with the sacrament on page 11. Please stand. The Lord be with you. you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Blessed are you, Lord God, eternal King and gracious Father. In love you made us the crown of your creation. In mercy you planned our salvation. In grace you sent your Son to redeem us from sin. We remember and give you thanks that your eternal Son, Jesus Christ, became flesh and made his dwelling among us, that he willingly placed himself under law to redeem those under law, that he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death on a cross, that he has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Bless us as we receive your son's body and blood in this sacrament. Forgive our sins, increase our faith, strengthen our fellowship, and deepen our longing for the day when Christ will welcome us to his eternal feast. Praise and thanks and honor and glory be to you, O God, our Father, and to your Son and to the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
may be seated. Please note that during the distribution today, you're invited to join in singing the hymn that is printed in your service folder. Please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with the closing hymn.